on March 18th, 2024, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, or the ABC for short, funded and subsequently aired a documentary on their program Four Corners, made by Journeyman Pictures. The documentary in question is titled Ukraine's War, The Other Side, and attempts to present an alternative view of Russia's invasion of Ukraine by embedding with the Russian forces on the front line while interviewing the various individual soldiers encountered. But, much like Tucker Carlson's efforts in interviewing Vladimir Putin, what is presented as an attempt to attain a holistic worldview or contribute to the historical record is instead simply purveying the narrative of the Kremlin while demonstrating the fact that 99% of the Russian soldiers on the front line have no illusions about what their role is and, in fact, believe in that cause wholeheartedly, all while denying any wrongdoing. And my government, the Australian State Broadcasting Corporation, is directly responsible for facilitating and spreading what essentially amounts to Russian propaganda, presented by a reporter who has called for the arrest and prosecution of British servicemen volunteering in Ukraine, even calling for them to be stripped of their citizenship despite claiming professional neutrality in his reporting. This is an absolute disgrace. As an Australian, a patriotic Australian no less, who has been covering this war from its very beginning, the fact that my government, my tax dollars being spent in my name, have been used to put a former member of the Wagner Group on camera and giving him a platform to deny the war crimes committed by the group, while specifically claiming that the massacre at Butcher, an event I was one of the first independent channels here on YouTube to cover, was not committed by Russian forces, that it was manufactured and faked, despite the overwhelming third-party evidence to the contrary. When I was researching my report on the incident at the time, I filtered through the raw data coming through the various online resources uploading it. And while my experience does not even compare to that of the people who first responded to the incident, I won't ever forget the things I saw. And the idea that my government is directly platforming this narrative, defending their decision to do so on their Twitter account and all their social media platforms, while closing off any method of complaint or protest for its circulation, including on their main website, no. No, no, no. You don't get off that easy. So, I'm going to dismantle this thing section by section. Strap yourselves in, everyone. It's time for discount-friendly Geordies at home, because today I'm fighting the ABC. But first, because I'm not a state broadcaster, I have to do some capitalism. This video has kindly been sponsored by the world's fastest and most popular VPN service provider, NordVPN. In today's ever-changing technology landscape, a VPN is vital for staying safe online. We all know what a VPN is by now, and let's be honest, most of us have one. We use it to get around region blockers and access our favourite content, which, as an anime fan, I definitely need. We use it to keep our data safe from hackers, we use it to secure our IP, and you can be sure that Nord does everything a great VPN should do, and it does it brilliantly, but what you might not know is that it does much more than that. Nord's active protection shields you from malware, trackers and ads, the inbuilt dark web monitor notifies you if someone steals your credentials, MeshNet allows you to connect up to six devices remotely and securely, and it comes with a dedicated IP that helps you avoid capachas and block lists. In my job here at YouTube, I have to go to corners of the internet a normal person really shouldn't be going to, so Nord's security features are vital for me, and they are vital for you. But the best part is, they don't track your information or share it, and are fully encrypted at all times, with an emergency kill switch should things get out of control. They have 24-7 customer support, a dedicated app for every device, and right now, you can get four months extra on a two-year plan by just clicking the link in the description below. They have a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you literally have nothing to lose by giving them a try. So please do give them a try. Click the link in the description and get that special offer. Plus, you'll help the channel, and I appreciate all the help I can get. Now, back to the video. Alright, so we will start this mess off at the beginning in the presenter Sean's own words. I was warned not to go in with the Russians. And some people ask, should we even be telling their side of the story? But when I found myself riding into battle with the Russian army, I began to think I might have gone too far over to the other side. 
But at that point, it was too late to turn back. So, first things first. Should we be telling the Russian side of the story? And the answer to this, to be frank, is no. We shouldn't be. Academically, as a historian, I am, of course, despite my own personal views on the situation, adamant that we should secure as much primary source material as possible from Russian personnel regarding their invasion of Ukraine. However, this war is unlike any other war seen before in our history, in that the combatants on both sides have both the ability and one could even say the social imperative to share their experiences directly to the public, without the filter of either journalists or the state. When you see debates raging both online and in the halls of power regarding the war, the information published by both sides is treated with extreme skepticism, and rightly so. Nations at war, particularly Eastern European nations which have very tight press control even in peacetime, have a vested interest in pushing their propaganda narrative regardless. If Ukraine is to be believed completely, they've killed or seriously wounded nearly half a million enemy combatants while the Russians claim to have destroyed the entire Ukrainian air force about five times over. Yet, they keep making these claims, even as Ukrainian air-launched Scalp cruise missiles blast Crimea on a weekly basis from an Su-24 fleet that is still very much alive, which frankly I cannot actually believe they've managed to pull off, given how maintenance-heavy those aircraft are and the amount of spares they would need. But anyway, that's a digression. The point is, with social media... Telegram, WhatsApp, GoPros, the huge proliferation of drones on the battlefield filming most major engagements, catalogued by an absolutely huge number of open source intelligence archivists on both sides, not to mention the large number of independent journalists and content creators covering the war, people like myself, my friend Dylan Burns, as well as the considerable number of war bloggers and embedded journalists on the Russian side. A Western reporter working indirectly for a state broadcaster, especially given the content and context we will see later throughout this video, doesn't add any insight nor any content of historical value. Rather, it does something very harmful. It adds legitimacy to Putin's invasion. It aims to both sides the conflict and push a narrative that directly undermines support for Ukraine's resistance to the illegal assault on their country. A commenter on my Twitter feed said it best. Remember when Ed Murrow flew to Paris in June of 1944 to interview the SS troops fighting in Normandy? Me neither. The Russian soldiers, either now through social media or in the future through the books and memoirs they will inevitably write, will be able to make their case and record their experiences just as they are doing now. All this man is doing is creating propaganda for the Kremlin while using his position as a Western filmmaker to add legitimacy to its content. And as I showed at the start, his sole tweet made on the war, and he is supposedly a journalist covering it, his sole tweet discussing the war calls for British troops returning from Ukraine to be arrested and stripped of their citizenship. So it doesn't take much imagination to know whose side he's on. And, as if to accentuate my point, have a look at the Russian flag patch on his plate carrier. And note that his entire uniform that he's wearing, his helmet, his plate carrier, none of it is marked as press. Which is very interesting, because you'd think as a journalist in Ukraine, he would clearly mark himself as press. Anyway, moving on. I'd read all the reports on war crimes, but as I drove down from Moscow, I didn't really know what to expect. The Russian-occupied territory in the east of Ukraine, known as the Donbass region, had been under an effective media blackout. I know this is a small thing, and I may be reading into it too much, but the framing language he uses in the overdub seems very well laundered. The documentary itself is titled Ukraine's War, not Russia's Invasion, not the Russo-Ukrainian War, it's simply titled Ukraine's war, and he states that he has heard the reports of war crimes. He doesn't say Russian war crimes, he just says war crimes. Now in every war there are atrocities on both sides, in fact war in of itself is an atrocity, but given the evidence we have it's very clear that the Russian occupation has led to devastation, mass graves, roundups and deportations, with efforts to Russify Ukrainian children. There's a word for that by the way, it starts with G. 
So I think we should be calling a spade a spade here. But let's get back to it. He continues on and travels to the Donbass region, and this section does start better, as he correctly refers to it as Russian-occupied Ukraine. However, the segment quickly transitions into interviews with DPR fighters, who are very quick to say that they are fighting for hearth and home, defending their families, defending their homes and firesides. There is a particularly striking moment with this soldier here, where they use a dramatic frame skip slow motion effect to emphasize the very real trauma the man has experienced. The horrors of war afflict all those involved. This isn't a new revelation. Anyone who's read All Quiet on the Western Front can confirm that. Its emphasis here, though, is to garner sympathy. And perhaps for the separatist regions, there is a discussion to be had there. But I would point out that there is a very stark historical parallel with how this entire discussion is being framed. And that parallel is the Confederate Lost Cause mythos. Yes, we are defending our homes and families. We are fighting for the Donbass. We are fighting for states' rights, or in this case, our oblast's rights. And so the timeless refrain comes back. States' rights to what? In this case, it states rights to secede and join the Russian Federation, condemning half the residents of the Donbass, if not more, to a Russian occupation which, in the words of a Russian soldier we'll meet later, they categorically don't want. But that isn't the worst of it. Oh no. The most egregious part of this entire section is his conversation with this soldier, a former member of Wagner Group, who says this every day about how when the Russians uh, left there were all these bodies and they were accused they were accused of war crimes there now do I really need to elaborate on this? There have been no less than three different independent full-scale investigations of the Bucha massacre. Amnesty International, the United Nations Organization for Human Rights, and the New York Times. All of which go into specific detail. The perpetrators were identified as elements of the VDV, supported by the Wagner Group and Katarov's Chechens. And while I can't show any of the direct research images from my own original investigation due to YouTube's terms of service, I can show you this footage here. This footage was taken from Bucha during the Russian withdrawal from the area, following their failed offensive on Kyiv. In it you can clearly identify a BMD-2M, an air mobile infantry fighting vehicle operated by the VDV, painted in Russian invasion markings. You can see them firing on a civilian on a bike as they turn the corner onto the street they live on. Their body was geolocated to this exact location in Bucha by investigators entering the area after the Russians withdrew. This is a confirmed on-camera example of the intentional targeting of civilians by Russian forces inside Bucha by the units implicated in the investigation, backed up by no less than three exhaustive investigations by three well-reputed independent sources. And Sean the presenter here decides not to raise any challenge to these claims or any objection to the man's assertions. He alludes to it, but he does not refute it citing potential risk to his safety if he does so. Which in my mind removes all credibility from his report, for the simple fact of what's the point of embedding with the enemy and going all the way out there unless you are going to ask the hard questions, unless you're going to ask questions that we don't already know the answer to. He simply just blows it off and moves on. So I guess this non-accredited YouTuber who just wants to make history documentaries has to do your job for you. Let's continue. Notice the unit he's embedding with here. All of them are rocking Putin patches, and they also seem to be remarkably clean compared to the guys working on that T-80 over there. It's very obvious that these are his handlers. Though I must confess, Sean's begging for sympathy does work on me here a little bit, simply because of that crewman complaining about how the whole vehicle needs to be torn down and rebuilt, and that speaks to the soul of anyone who knows the slightest thing about maintaining an armoured vehicle. 
Especially that abomination with its gas turbine engine. I've heard things said about the Striker IFV that would get me demonetized forever with the amount of foul language that accompanied it. So, I have some sympathy. But unless he drives that tank to the front, abandons it, and then deserts or surrenders to the Ukrainians, that's the limit of my sympathy. And speaking of sympathy, his interview with this 19-year-old is more both sides bait. Uh, good, good man. Yeah. Uh, and it as I said at the start, I have to be very careful with the amount of footage I show you, but the questions he asks throughout this interview do not probe this guy's thoughts on the war, nor does he ask any of the pertinent or difficult questions that you would expect to ask or you would want to ask a Russian soldier currently deployed to Ukraine. All he's asking about is the conditions, which given this was filmed just after the Kharkiv counteroffensive as they retreated from Izium, were evidently not very good. He asks about the fighting, which was heavy, and then he asks him if he lost any friends. It's very clear the direction Sean wants this discussion to go. He doesn't want to uncover the real opinions or the core experience of Russian soldiers, he wants to put out a fluffy sob story, doesn't provide any insight whatsoever, and if his attempt was to get an unbiased, unfiltered view of the war, it is a gratuitous failure exacerbated by professional cowardice. Now regards to the kid himself, forgive me for sounding a bit harsh here, but the Ukrainians have lost friends too. Hell, all the Ukrainians I know have lost friends or family to this war. The difference is, this is their country, not his, and he wouldn't have lost those friends had he not marched in there. And it's that fact in particular where Sean scores an own goal because he asks the kid if he was mobilized, only to be told no. He and his comrades are kontraktniki, they volunteered. And his opinion on the defeat in Kharkiv Oblast reinforces that fact. He does not regret the battle or the war itself, Rather, he regrets retreating from Izium as it meant his friends died for nothing. And while I can understand that sentiment, it doesn't change the fact that he's part of an invading settler colonial army. And the fact is, yes, his friends did die for nothing. They died for nothing but the vanity of a decrepit old dictator clinging to power in his shell of an empire that is slowly crumbling around him. However, in fairness, the very next segment is perhaps the only piece of decent journalism in this entire documentary. And it's not even due to the presenter or the production company, it happened completely by accident. Rather, it's due to this Kontraktniki sergeant, who is perhaps the only Russian soldier I've seen throughout this entire war who I have any respect for. Ну, то есть регионы, как говорят, типа нас там пичкали этим, типа 8 лет бомбили, бомбили там Донбасс. Ну, как бы это тоже политика такая там. Это их регионы, получается, украинские, они захотели отделиться. Но а взять нашу, да, захотел Белгородская область, типа все, мы хотим быть независимыми. Что наш так их отпустит? Да никто так не отпустит. Также и начнет всякие силовые действия. This man sees through the propaganda the Kremlin is spewing, and he says so very clearly to a Russian press team. He disputes the old Vatnik catch cry of what about the bombings in the Donbass, offering a counterpoint that Russia wouldn't let Belgorod or Rostov rise up in rebellion and secede, they wouldn't let that slide either. He relays to the press that his interactions with the local populace say they don't want to be a part of Russia and that their presence here has made things far worse than they were before. He goes so far to say that two out of the three residents in Donetsk, Donetsk Oblast, one of the separatist regions of the DPR, half the people, if not two-thirds of the people, told him they want Russia to leave, they want the Russians out. He is here to do a job because he's been ordered to, and he will honour his obligations to do so. But he isn't political because in his words, on both sides, it's all bullshit. Naturally, he is immediately countered by his Putin-loving press handler, wearing a squeaky clean uniform with no combat patches, telling him he's wrong as the voiceover tells us that his comments were edited out of the Russian edition of this broadcast. But while I wish to see him defeated and Ukraine to be free of the Russian invaders, 
He is the only man in this entire 40 minute documentary who actually speaks his mind and offers a substantive opinion and has something worthwhile or insightful to say. Unfortunately for our hapless presenter, the next group of Russians he meets are not so circumspect. So Sean rides along to the next location with his handlers and this discount Prigozhin looking mother to a warehouse where they have two expended one-use anti-tank launchers on the boot, excuse me, the trunk of a car. One of them is an AT4, which you can tell has been fired. The other one I can't really identify, though I think it's a Spanish C90. That doesn't matter though. What matters is they hold these things in pride of place, like, look what we have. Discount Prigo even says they're going to destroy them because the Russian weapons are better, which gave me a good laugh given they're just garbage tubes. But they are suddenly interrupted by very angry Spetsnaz, who are upset at the presence of a journalist. That is until our presenter acts very friendly and asks for an interview. Given that he has been approved by the Kremlin, they grant it. And what follows is, as you would expect, to borrow a phrase from times past, the party line. Они считают, что мы отступаем. Это тактический прием. Мы обязательно идем вперед. Пускай они так думают, что мы отступаем. И то, что говорят, что русские отступают, мораль не искали. Нет, это неправда. Они ошибаются очень сильно. Они забыли русский дух. У них этого духа уже нет просто-напросто. А русский дух он непобедим. They declare that their withdrawal from Kharkiv and by implication their retreat from Kiev were tactical redeployments, not failed offensives, and that the Russian spirit is unbreakable. Morale is sky high and they are advancing on all fronts. The enemy will find their death and Mother Russia will reign victorious, etc, etc, blah, blah, blah. All this interview does is repeat the same propaganda that we see on pro-Russian Telegram and coming out of the Kremlin, the only difference being it's coming from a Western mainstream media source attempting to add legitimacy it most definitely doesn't deserve. Mercifully, however, after giving their spiel, they begin to leave, but not before once again dapping up the presenter, as though he is not a neutral investigator at all, but rather a friend of the Russians. Which is immediately confirmed by this next segment here. <laughs> Listen to the music, the footage of his wife and kids. Oh, how sad it all is. And then you look to the top left of frame and see the patch on that guy's hat. A Russian imperial nationalist flag, which in modern usage is linked to far-right nationalists and imperial revanchists. Ergo, we are supposed to feel sad and sympathetic for these young men fighting a war away from their families, while simultaneously showing that they are an invading army fighting an imperialist war of aggression to recover territory they believe was and should be theirs. But the best part of all of this is, they confirm that hypothesis themselves just before this sob story takes place, as seen here. Мы не жертвы пропаганды, мы не политики, мы не какие-то там... Is there a little bit of hurt that the West doesn't understand their side? Как может не расстраивать? Правда, она вся здесь. И если Запад поймет то, что правда, она не является реалием того, что происходит на самом деле, ну, как они хотят. They proclaim that they are not victims of propaganda or politicians. But the West is, and they are certain that the West will be, quote, disappointed. Also, side note, what kind of question is that? If you weren't sure what the presenter's aim is with this film before, you are now. Does it hurt that the people in the West don't understand your side? No. No, Sean. That's not the issue. We understand their side crystal clear, and the response has already been given for us. A bunch of brave Ukrainians gave us the perfect response. Roll clip. Man, this video is already 20 minutes long. Well, let's keep going. The next segment here is again a continuation of trying to pull the sympathy card. Though in this case, it does touch on an actual serious point. 
that being the close familial and cultural ties between Russia and Ukraine due to their shared history as part of the Soviet Union. This older Russian soldier, who apparently is a sniper with a British scope, remarks that his wife is Ukrainian from Dnepropetrovsk. I apologize if I pronounced that wrong. His wife's family have since cut the Russian side of the family off completely and do not speak to his wife or daughter at all, while the male members of the family are fighting against him on the other side in the armed forces of Ukraine, which he, most likely correctly, assumes his family is falling apart because he volunteered to fight in the Russian army's invasion. And again, while having an opportunity to examine a crucial and very human aspect of the conflict, an opportunity to ask this man, your wife is Ukrainian, why volunteer to fight for the Russians? What do you actually think of this war and how it's playing out? What do you think of the fact that your government is quite possibly committing crimes against the relatives of your very own flesh and blood? Instead, he doesn't do any of that. He doesn't ask any of these questions. It is yet more sob story fluff trying to make us feel sorry for an invading genocidal settler colonial army. But as the old joke goes, when discussing matters about Russia. Don't worry everyone, it gets worse. In the very next scene, it shows a person killed by Ukrainian shelling in the city of Donetsk. I won't show this on YouTube for obvious reasons. Now this is a horrible thing. It shouldn't happen. We should make every effort to prevent it from happening. But the sad fact about war is that it does happen. It happens daily. But as the NCO interviewed by Russian TV earlier so eloquently pointed out, prior to their full-scale invasion in 2022, and the insurgency launched by Russian covert operations units nicknamed the Little Green Men in 2014, before all of that took place, this sort of thing didn't happen. The pain and suffering of the Ukrainian people is at the hands of Putin's regime and its servants. Yet again, though, Sean immediately undercuts his objective of garnering sympathy for the Russian cause and the Russian occupiers by transitioning to this absolute waste of space. But to his credit, he actually asks a decent question. That being, what would you accept as compromise? What would you compromise on? How would you accept the war ending? However, I don't think he was banking on the answer he got. I don't really have a comment here. I hope I don't get copyright struck. Just watch. No, on this territory, on Ukraine, we create a new country, a союзная нам часть уже, в общем-то, вошла русскоязычные регионы Донбасс, но Новороссия войдет в состав России. Другое государство Украина будет просто нам дружное, союзное. We want to return to us this land. And oh, and uh, uh, sorry, and, when, and when yeah. and when yeah. we kill and when we killed last Nazi, yeah, war will end. I don't think you can get any more blatant than that. I've got nothing. He speaks for the Kremlin. It speaks for itself. Moving on. Nothing really happens in this next segment of the documentary. Artillery starts landing in the vicinity, so they put on their vests, again, with no press accreditation on the plate carrier or a helmet while the vest he is wearing is Russian issue in Russian camo, and later a Russian flag on it, so yeah, that's not great. He then has this weird interaction with a woman walking her dog, and again, he doesn't ask any serious or substantive questions. He just says hello, introduces himself, and then asks someone in a war zone, currently sheltering from artillery fire, if they feel safe. Uh, uh, does she feel safe here? Does she want... Do you feel safe now? No. Here? Here? No. Most people in America right now probably think of Iraq as a dangerous country. Now, if I were to stand up, I might get killed. 
But to us, behind this wheel, it's pretty safe. <laughs> so to us, Iraq is a safe country, right here. I feel pretty safe. Do you feel safe? And then he leaves. Doesn't elaborate, just leaves. Don't you worry though, dear viewers, we have some premium propaganda coming up. There is this phenomenon in post-Soviet countries, especially in, I suppose, for lack of a better term, the core territories, like Eastern Ukraine, Western Russia, and Belarus, which is very similar to the American conservative romanticization of the 1950s, where boomers in Eastern Europe and those countries romanticize the Soviet Union or hold pro-Russian sentiment. The younger generations who grew up during the collapse and the post-Soviet world are not exactly keen for a return to the bad old days of the USSR, but the older generation miss the era of their youth in the Khrushchev thaw, resulting in this weird situation that in Russia, and until it was banned, in Ukraine as well, the Communist Party are actually right-wing traditional conservatives. It's Russia, don't expect it to make any sense. The reason I bring all this up is he runs across an old babushka and interviews her, and she immediately goes on a rant against the Zelensky regime, saying that we Russians won't give in, and when she realises that she is speaking to a British reporter, she immediately pivots and says, we shouldn't be enemies, we should be friends, you should join up with us and help. It's very... on the nose? Like, I I don't doubt her sincerity, but if you were to ask this question of a young Ukrainian or even a young Russian, I've seen interviews from the 1420 Project, I think they're called, who are in Russia and ask young Russians what they think about this whole situation. They either say no comment because they don't want to get arrested, or they are very unhappy with the idea of reverting to the USSR and being under direct Russian occupation, or in the Russian case, invading Ukraine in the first place. So, you know, it's just, again, sob story fluff propaganda. And while I echo the sentiment that peace and friendship would definitely be better than the war we're fighting, first, Russia has to stop invading its neighbours and attempting to eliminate their native cultures and identities. You gotta stop with the uh, settler colonialism and imperialism before we start having the whole friendship thing. And that's pretty much it. That's the end of the documentary in terms of like actual proper interviews and such. Sure, he visits a field hospital, which has Putin hanging pride of place, and when he asks about it, they reaffirm their love for the glorious leader, and it's then they inform him an assault will be taking place, and they expect casualties. Sure enough, they show Sean the drone feed, and the Russians assault a tree line, only for their IFVs and APCs to get entered into the turret-tossing tournament by the Ukrainian defenders. Later, our host joins the Russian infantry on their advance to the front line, once again, not wearing any press accreditation while wearing a Russian flag patch. He does this while high-fiving the Russian troops as he goes forward. Yeah, I can't imagine myself as a reporter, as a serious journalist, going to Auschwitz or Dachau or Buchenwald to interview the guards or the commandant and then shaking their hands and high-fiving the guards in the tower as I walk past, you know? I can't imagine doing that. And yet, this guy does exactly that. And then, once again, once he gets to the front line, when he gets to the front line trenches and meets the troops at the front of the Russian advance, he asks the same useless sympathy bait questions. Does it hurt your feelings that the West doesn't understand what you're doing here? Do you think that the West is bad and evil because they just won't listen to your side of the story? It's so useless. In all of these interviews, I know I keep saying it, he doesn't ask anything of substance. He doesn't ask any tough questions. He asks like two real questions in this entire thing. He spends 40 minutes just showing fluff. Nothing else. Nothing else. I mean, 
I don't want to shill my friend Dylan too hard, but, like, seriously, if you look at some of his documentaries, he'll go up to, like, a member of Azov or Pravi Sektor and then ask him about neo-Nazism. Or he'll go up to artillery troopers on the front line and ask them about their shell shortages and logistical challenges and morale. Like, he'll ask tough questions. This guy went out there to get the truth and the Russian side of the story and then asked a bunch of fluff, both sidesy, oh, please feel bad for them questions. And then, like, he was a journalist for, like, two minutes. Out of a 44-minute documentary, he was a journalist for two minutes. God damn it. He achieved nothing. Absolutely nothing. Anyway, as the documentary closes out, this is what he says. Putin has failed to bring Kyiv to heel. And the invasion has only strengthened Ukraine's sense of national identity. I met a lot of good men on the front lines. But in years to come, I couldn't help wondering how many would still believe in the cause. I don't know about you, but referring to men currently waging a blatant war of aggression categorically saying throughout the documentary that they are doing so for nationalist imperialist reasons on the orders of a known dictator saying that they will only accept taking Kiev. you know what i mean describing them as good men and then referring to the invasion as quote the cause really doesn't present an unbiased unveiling of the reality of the war from the Russian perspective. Throughout this entire documentary, no valuable historical insight was gained. There were no substantial or difficult questions asked. It was literally all fluff. This whole thing is garbage. I didn't even have to do any debunking. You know what I mean? Like normally this is where I would get my source list and cite a UN report on something. But besides for the butcher segment, I didn't have to do any debunking. I just have to point out just how garbage this documentary is. It doesn't offer us anything we can't get by submitting a request to the Kremlin PR department. We are getting the party line. We are getting Tucker's interview in a much more condensed version. In fact, all we are getting is the simple we have Vladimir Putin's story at home. Like, this is just the party line of the Kremlin with his hour-long history lesson left out. That's all this is. It's, we're doing this because it's the right thing to do, because this was always Russian land. We're doing this because we're fighting for our friends and our family and for freedom, because we want to annex all of this territory. And all of them say it. All of the people interviewed here, most of them are volunteers, if not all of them. And they all say the exact same thing. It's just, he tries to generate this sympathetic view and it just blows up in his face. Not only is it a bad documentary, not only is it dangerous because it adds a sense of legitimacy and tries to generate sympathy for Russian soldiers engaged in a genocidal settler colonial invasion. It does all this while failing to do it. He didn't even get it right. It's not just propaganda, it's bad propaganda. And that's offensive to me personally. I mean, think about the success the game Helldivers 2 has had recently. That's how you do propaganda. God, it's an insult to the craft. I mean, Laserpig and I are technically, because we've worked with United24, actual certified bona fide Ukrainian propaganda, and our videos have more effort than this so-called professional production. It's embarrassing. And as I said, the worst part of it is my tax dollars helped pay for this and circulate it. My government is platforming this and distributing it online and on social media and on television for the boomers to watch. It's a disgrace. The ABC should be ashamed. In fact, the ABC's director should resign, as far as I'm concerned. 
Anyway, this video turned out to be a little bit shorter than the documentary, and you didn't have to watch some useless British journalist who's breaking all the conventions of war journalism walk through a field for 10 minutes. So I guess we're winning. And we got to see a BMP blow up, so I guess that's a win. Anyway, support the channel on Patreon, like and subscribe. Thank you for Nord sponsoring this video. I'll see you guys next time. The ABC is a disgrace. Anamaki out.